On a cool fall afternoon, the auditorium at Maison de la Paix in Geneva was packed. There are no watches up for display. There are no new launches. But some of the big wigs of the watch industry are seated around me. Delphine Bashman, Madame State Councillor Geneva Canton, and Pascal Rassevu, Vice President of FHH, are seated in front of me. Long-time media friends and seasoned watch editors who, like me, are watch aficionados, Elizabeth Dorr, editor of Quill & Pad, Susan Wong, editor of World Tempest, are seated on my left. In front of me is Guido Pterini, CEO of Parmajani Floor, a brand I love for making complications which look simple. He shares the table with Maximilian Busser, CEO of MBNF Watches, another brand. It is 10 degree outside and the auditorium is the location for the 11th forum organized by Foundation de la Haute Olagerie, FHH, a not-for-profit organization that was established as a point of reference and neutrality for all subjects relating to watchmaking. Welcome to a brand new episode with me, your host, Anita Khatri. This week, I bring to you my learnings from the FHH Forum, where industry experts got together to reflect and introspect the future of the watch industry. Stick with me for this short, sweet episode, wherein towards the end, I will also unveil five important learnings on the watch consumer's behavior based on the research conducted by Deloitte, and I promise it will not be boring. Every year, the FHH Forum brings together the watch fraternity in Geneva in a day-long conference. The discussions revolve around a theme. So this year, the theme was Orology, Futurology. Got you thinking? Well, let's hear from Pascal Rassevu, the VP of FHH, what this 11th edition entails. I also had to ask him how they arrived at picking up the theme for this year. Today is about the future of our industry. We want to take a time to reflect on the future of the industry when we are in a world that is really shaken after the COVID, after you know everything that's going on in this world, conflicts, migration, climate change. There are so much going uh, things going on. And so the futurology is actually to look in the future, what we can expect in terms of taking care of our clients that are at the same time embracing digital and uh, artificial intelligence, and on the other hand, also uh, engaging experiences in brick and mortar shops. So it's a frenzy world, and we want to tackle this and see how we can best adapt to these clients. And the okay. idea is to be relevant with the. Uh, with, with what's happening in the world. Okay. And so uh, after the forum, we will reconvene and say, okay, what, what, what can be put forward? What are the questions that are in everyone's mind that uh, need to, uh, to get an answer? This is how it works. It is heartening to know that the luxury watch industry has a heart. I'm sure you would agree with me that this forum where experts and the horology fraternity come together to pause and reflect on what the future will hold post considering the economic scenario, the biodiversity. Basically, the impact of watchmaking on nature and the world in itself is an indication of this industry having a soul. I mean, we know the market is growing exponentially and they can simply increase production of watches and make more profits. It's so simple, but they choose to pause and reflect. Coming back to my discussion with Pascal, I asked him to throw light on the changing consumer behavior, being a veteran in the industry for 20 plus years. His take was interesting and let's listen. 
<laughs> the changes have been massive. Mm -hmm. And I, I would say the most massive change, of course, uh, the evolution of the customers has also followed the evolution of technology. Mm -hmm. So uh, digital uh, was a big subject over the last uh, few years, uh, starting from uh, having uh, information on the web, you know, like 20 years ago, uh, web was just starting and information about watchmaking started spread. And therefore, uh, the, uh, the consumers were more and more informed. And uh, that was actually raising an issue in uh, the point of sales, because the distribution at that time was very classic. It was like retail and wholesale, but there was no online distribution. So people going in the stores, uh, the consumers were more knowledgeable than uh, people selling the watches. Correct. And this has prompted also uh, the foundation to develop a whole range of trainings. And we developed our FHH Academy according to this. The forum had multiple panel discussions whose stage was shared by economist, an Oxford University professor, a cultural analyst, government officials and other such specialists. Of course, at the opening of the session, I had no idea what value would an economist, a cultural analyst or your university professor bring and get the CEOs of the Rolex, Odma Pige, Patek Philip, etc. to get their thinking caps on so as to make the watch industry ready for the future. That answer I got at the end of my day at this very forum. Ian Golding, a professor at Oxford University, set the context for the afternoon. His talk got the room to pause and think about how brands and the watch industry cannot escape the many challenges the world is facing. He shared an important view. Creativity in the watch design and manufacturing has reached its peak in the last 50 years and is only going to grow. The demand for watches has also peaked. However, with this growth, questions around the brands in this industry's commitment to sustainability can be put to question. Are we able to escape the world economic challenges that we face today? For example, when the pandemic hit us, we were unable to escape the same. Even air-conditioned cocoon cities like Dubai, San Francisco couldn't escape the effect of a health crisis such as COVID-19. Did it get you thinking? I think it is a beautiful way to connect the world environment and the impact of the watch brands. It was an open invitation to pause and think. Another interesting conversation came from the panel discussion with Inez Leonarduzzi, a cultural analyst. Her talk was enlightening. She stressed on the part of the need to adapt ourselves to new rituals and routines so that we can adapt to dynamics of the world in order to leave behind a better future for the next generations. She emphasized that the better future can be achieved by thinking differently to combine short-term thinking that is addressing the needs of today, what is urgent now and long-term thinking, which is forecasting the business decision taken today and its impact maybe 100 years later. This is difficult, but it's necessary. Lastly, the panel discussion with Bruno David, the former director of the National Museum of Natural History, spoke about the interconnectivity between nature and mankind and how we can shape our future according to our actions. He questioned if we are being paradoxical, our behavior in 2023 and how biodiversity concerns us. Why did he say that we are behaving paradoxical? We love nature, but we destroy the planet. We have passed 8 billion people on earth and this in turn induces pressure on biodiversity and overuse of resources, which in fact impacts the climate. We are on this trajectory. 
we have lost so many species of flora and fauna he further explained with an example his grandfather owned only one watch in his entire lifetime while bruno david already owns more than 10 watches while we all desire owning more and more he urges the audience to pause think and consider the upstream biodiversity before adding that new risk candy to the collection this is exactly what i meant that forum is a time that fhh helps us to pause and get the industry to think about he urges the audience to spend some time every day for 5 minutes with nature looking around and connecting with nature and i quite agree with him and now to the key findings from the deloitte swiss watch industry study 2023 that was revealed towards the end of the day this study is based on an online survey of 75 senior executives in the industry interviews with industry experts and an an online survey was also conducted during the same period that is between august and september 2023 of 6045 consumers in the domestic swiss market and top export markets for swiss watches china france germany hong kong italy japan singapore the united arab emirates the united kingdom and the united states the findings were revealed by karin sagadi the managing partner consumer industry and fashion and luxury i was taken aback when i first heard india's name being taken in this study the surprise turned into pride as i learned that this year consumers in india were also surveyed as it is considered an important growing market i caught up with kareen to understand what made them include india in their study and she had some interesting points to share you have been doing this for many many years right uh, kareen did you find india was dynamic challenging while you were doing the study well interestingly you know there are several angles for example we can try to compare the the responses of the indian consumer watch watch buyer to the under to the others so it realized that when we said do you wear a watch and there is an option of a traditional watch a smart watch both watches we see that the indian consumer 94% of the indian consumers wear a watch which is much much higher than all the other consumers in other countries we've noted as well that the indian consumers um are very interested in buying a watch in the next 12 months and as well that they like the option when they do uh, go online they want to see now buy now like the fear of missing out mm-hmm. um because supply is not always guaranteed in india mm-hmm. and that's maybe the the, the the behavior that is a bit different in india from other countries as for the other five important learnings let me summarize this for you one consumers globally continue to shop in stores to ensure no chance of counterfeit besides it being an emotional experience and of course they prefer to touch their watches this is 73% of the customers buy watches in boutiques when the watch is priced above swiss franc 15000 which is equivalent to rupees 14.60 lakhs customers however are open to indulging online shopping for watches which are priced below the swiss franc 15000 which is approximately rupees 14 lakhs two 43% of indian customers decide to change the brand if asked to wait for a particular piece hence if you want to sell to the indian consumer please ensure availability of the time pieces We love to buy things with a philosophy abhi chahiye want it right now right here Three when we try to understand the factors that lead consumers to arrive at the decision to buy a particular time piece surprisingly till date we know and understand the indian consumer wants only and only discount so this is what we are always told right 
I guess this counts of course, but it is not always the case. Buying decisions for watches in India are driven by the image of the brand, the design, followed by the price and its value ratio, as revealed by the study's findings. Different markets behave differently. For example, in China, buying decisions are driven by brand image, price value ratio followed by longevity and circularity. Fourth, the future is women. As women's earning potential increases, they are buying watches as accessories and turning to them for investment. The study also mentions while women can buy themselves flowers, Two-thirds of their respondents are buying their own timepieces for their personal use. There are now women watch influencers who are beyond taking selfies with their timepieces. They are talking watch business, watch complication and moments fearlessly wearing complications. More and more women will buy their watches and this I have to rejoice as I launch Jam. Just a minute ma'am. India's first watch club for women and this was purely what I believed three years ago without any research or any data. 5. Pre-owned market is going to grow. Most industry executives, 71% see the pre-owned market as positively influencing brand perception and value. Additionally, 63% consider the secondary market as a welcome source for awareness and visibility for the industry and 64% think it enables a new type of clientele to experience a brand. Millennials and Generation Z, Generation Alpha are more inclined to buy a pre-owned timepiece. Baby boomers will still prefer to buy a fresh new timepiece. On the brand side of things, Rolex and Longines have introduced their respective certified pre-owned programs. But not a lot of brands are investing their marketing budget for certified pre-owned watches. Currently, the pre-owned market is being serviced by marketplaces such as Chrono24 Watchbox or Watchfinder & Company, retailers such as Bukharer, Hodenki, Tourneau or watches of Switzerland or auction houses Christie's, Philips and Sotheby's primarily for exceptional vintage timepieces. And lastly, sustainability approaches are now a part of corporate strategy for many brands. Embracing innovation is key for longevity. Over half that is 52% of executives surveyed plan to use generative AI to create content for written publications and reports in the coming year. Did the conversations and findings meet expectations? Yes, indeed for me. I got to learn so much here. I happened to ask the same question to Pascal and here's what he shared. I hope we can shed a light on uh, this ever-changing uh, world and what it actually implies for our brands. How should they engage uh, with their customers that are increasingly schizophrenic? Uh, one side, they embrace fully the digital revolution, uh, inter um, artificial intelligence. Uh, and on the other side, they are also engaging more and more in uh, experiences in brick and mortar shops. It was an immersive experience, which got me thinking and also made me happy that my dream and work towards this industry is finally here and the market is showing up. I'm witnessing all that I had dreamt of. It is only upwards from here. That's all from me on this episode. Join me next week for another interesting episode. Until then, please take care.